Good afternoon and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live. This is the school committee superintendent's update for September 30th, 2020. Joining me once again is chair of the Somerville School Committee, Carrie Norman. And we are so pleased to welcome Karen Woods. Karen Woods is the director of educator, educator development here for the Somerville Public School System. Karen is part of the uh, school cabinet along with uh, Superintendent Mary Skipper and a bunch of other people who make all of this run in addition to the educators and the school committee. Karen, welcome. Thank you very much, happy to be here. Great, terrific. Carrie, once again, um, we are going to deliver some good news, I hope, to the uh, students and the teachers and the parents. You're gonna give us kind of a wrap up of the first eight days of Somerville Public School going back into virtual session. So again, always good to see you. We are uh, in the second full week of school and you know there's been bumps i'm not going to pretend that it's all been perfect i will say uh we've had very high attendance up to 95 or so higher percent of students actually logging in um and that is happily i was happily surprised by that i can say in my house having a high schooler actually have a schedule again and a reason to get up at eight in the morning um has been a very very welcomed uh, there is the the rec programming and the outdoor programming is up and running, um, and like any time, any back to school, there's going to be some logistical glitches. It is far more complicated when you add all of this technology uh, in it. So uh, there was a, a security upgrade last week and some bumps, but I think um, nothing nothing that was derailed and nothing that wasn't fixed within a matter of hours. Terrific, terrific. I wanna ask a couple of questions. We're hearing uh, news reports and talk show hosts, they're talking about the difficulty. Um, and this specifically caught my ear this week before we get into Karen and ask her how the educators are doing. One thing that caught my ear was that there is a very, very distinct um, uh, observation that people are making about the younger kids in how they are adapting to virtual learning versus a little older, maybe in the fourth grade up yeah. kind mm -hmm. of sense. Can, can you kind of walk me through very quickly? Is it because younger children are less adaptable to technology or is it their attention span. I guess I'm, I tried to figure out the difference between, you know, say the 10 year old and the 13 year old. Well, I, there's a number of things that play. One, older kids have been in school longer. They have a, a sense of the routine. Younger kids, they learn mostly through play and through hands-on learning. And that is not available to them in the same way as it would be if we were in person. So uh, Karen has a preschool student who just started, so she can speak to this as a parent. It is one of the reasons why when we talk about a phased in hybrid of the populations that we are prioritizing to get back into the buildings first, are the younger children along with our special education students and our ELL students because we know uh, whether it's a programmatic need or a, a developmentally appropriate need those are the populations that we need to get back first who um, have a harder time re accessing learning uh, remotely well I know I spent 12 years of school playing so it makes sense to me Carrie, I'm going to hold off on any more updates and I want to dive right into Karen and specifically what she does um, at the SPS and how valuable that position is in terms of our educators. So Karen, if you could just give us a brief update as to what that job title entails. Sure, I would be happy to. Um, so again, my, my Karen Woods and my title is Director of Educator Development. And so that, that's a, a, a title that encompasses a lot of different ways that we help educators continue to develop and hone their craft and their skills. 
And so a, a big chunk of my work is focused on professional development um, and having a district-wide professional development vision um, that, that teachers can have a, a choice and say in, in what skills that they need. Um, oftentimes when there's PD or professional development, we abbreviate that PD, uh, at schools, it's, it's usually a one size fits all, you know, we're, we're all going to engage in this learning together, but oftentimes teachers have different, um, you know, areas for growth. And so my job is to create a menu of opportunities for, for educators to select from, essentially, to, to say, you know what, I'm really struggling in this area, or I really want to get better in this area. So let me look through the district catalog. Let me see what opportunities there might be for me to, to get better at those things and, and ultimately have an impact on their practice and their students. So Karen, it's not unlike what a lot of companies have, which are professional development. They have a director of professional development or they have a program that's administered by the executive director or by the board or somebody. So you play a vital role and probably a whole lot more this year because the needs are unique to COVID. So let me dive into it and I don't want you to get yourself in trouble. Okay. <laughs> but that's the nature of what I do. Sure. Is there a distinct learning curve with technology between younger educators and more mature educators? Sure, it, it's, a, it's a great question and a fair question. And I think what, what I've really seen from my experience is there are educators of all ages on the technology spectrum. <laughs> so it's not just younger teachers are better with technology and more experienced teachers have struggles. I think there's both sets of teachers at both ends of the spectrum. Um, and one thing, one thing we have come to realize, um, and, and I, I see this in data that I collect from teachers where I'm asking, you know, what, what are your needs right now? You know, what kind of PD would you like to see that would really help you? That the tech needs are there uh, in a way that was surprising, that, that people aren't as confident as they might seem. Um, and, and everyone wants to improve, even if they are on the, you know, I'm very good at this end of the spectrum, they still want to learn more and figure out ways, you know, different ways to use the technology to engage students and for instruction. Uh, and so we, we need to keep finding, this is the challenge, we need to keep finding instructors who are one step ahead uh, so that they can help the rest of, uh, of the teachers, you know, um, but luckily we, we do have, you know, an amazing group of educators who starting back in March stepped up and said, I, I know how to do this. Do you want me to help teach other people? And that has been absolutely incredible, vital. We could not have done it without uh, the help of the educators who said, I have these skills or I know this one platform really, really well, or, you know, I, I, I learned about this or I took this course over the summer. Can I share it now? I mean, it's really, sometimes I, I get, you know, complimented and, and, and people reach out and say, thank you so much for, for all the work you're doing. And, and I say, you're welcome, but really it's the educators that are leading these sessions that need to be the ones being thanked. I organize it and I'm happy to keep organizing it, um, but, but really that expertise, it, it lies with the teachers and the, the instructors of the different PDUs. So I think, I think it's, it's a fair assessment that the pandemic has thrown the entire education system into a fast track of learning themselves. Not only you know, from the top down, but right down to the parents who are now coming face to face with the realization of how difficult educating the child is. Um, so I guess you, know, you do as a normal course pre-COVID, you had duties and responsibilities of um, professional development, ensuring that the support systems were there for the curricula that the teachers were being asked to administer. And you also have, um, I would assume, you're gonna correct me, everyone does, so feel free, Karen. I assume that at some point, your job may migrate into the world of the unions as well because the unions are more known for their advocating for salaries and benefits. 
and maybe some of the working conditions. But is there, is there a significant overlap between what teachers ask of you and what the union can actually do for them? That's a really, really interesting question. <laughs> Thank you for, for asking that. Um, so my work does overlap quite extensively with, uh, with the union, with the Somerville Teachers Association. Um, and I feel that my experience as a former Somerville teacher uh, really brings a lot to, to being able to work and, if you will, speak the same language, right? Um, and, and so, you know, just as an example, so when the, the State Department of Ed, uh, DESI, you know, that we often call it, um, said, you know, we're going to give districts these 10 extra days for planning at the beginning of this year because of the situation. Uh, so instead of a 180 day school year, you know, it's okay that districts can have a, a school year that's 170 days and use the extra 10 days for planning purposes. Um, you know, I was tasked with thinking through what those opening days might look like for teachers and what their needs are. So I really just put on my ninth grade biology teacher hat that I wore for over a decade and I said, what would I need <laughs> if I was still in the classroom right now? You know, what what would I need to feel ready? And, and so I, I sketched up, you know, a, a mock, uh, a draft schedule based on that. I said I'd need a lot of planning time with my team and I would need a lot of planning time with uh, within the school, within grade level partners. So both, you know, subject grade level, I would need PD on these topics, etc. So I put this draft together and then I presented it to the union. Um, and, you know, for feedback and, and said, so this is what I came up with. What do you think? And the, the, the union had quite a, a large team that was working with them, you know, so there was a lot of uh, first voices in terms of grade levels and schools and, you know, and they looked at it and they, and they did give some feedback and some really great suggestions. But overall, they said, yeah, we think that's what we need. And so it, it's it's a nice, it's a really nice working partnership. And, and again, I'm just going to reiterate, I think that it's because, you know, we share that common experience of being classroom teachers in Somerville for so long. Um, and I think there was a second part to your question, but that's the that's where I went with it. Uh, so I guess I work with the union very closely. Um, and and I, I actually, I very much value that partnership because of those uh, great suggestions and perspectives from the teachers that it brings. No, it gives me a good sense of, you know, I, I, my world these days, I do my, I, I try to use part of my brain of pre-COVID, how did things work pre-COVID, yeah. and how are they working today, and how do we replicate that, knowing that the demands are much greater that are being put on us. So I'm going to flip back over to Carrie for a minute, because that kind of leads me to another part of the equation, which is that question that is on everybody's mind, um, the grand experiment of virtual learning um, is there. It's going to be there for the next X number of weeks or months. But Carrie and I spoke last time about the process that the city is going through, trying to constantly evaluate where we are. Um, so Carrie, I know that you had mentioned, and I saw something in one of the news feeds or one of the alerts that I get from the school system, is that a lot of what we're doing about in-person teaching has a component to it that I don't think a whole lot of people in the public are focused on, which is the building itself, the adaptability of the physical plant of bringing kids back into learning. Right. Um, I think that what I understand is there will be some type of announcement on December 1st. Help me with that. Um, so uh, uh, quickly, the buildings are uh, in our town in Somerville are on the city side. And so there was a town hall where the, you know, the Doug Cress, the director of health and human services is working on getting the surveillance testing, which race, uh, it used to be called Capital Projects, and now it has a lot longer name. Asset Basically, management. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so he's working on that, and so there's a, every week there are meetings between the city and the school leadership to work on these questions. Uh, last week at the town hall, the the city presented December first as a, a target date. Um, but I think people need to be very flexible in their thinking, right? I, I hope that some of our buildings, we have a wide range of ages and also the design of the buildings um, 
in some ways the more traditional classroom model is much better for COVID because you can isolate kids and keep them you know within a cohort so some of our buildings uh, are going to need more work than others and and I am continually going to advocate for bringing buildings online as they become available I mean my hope is that some of the the buildings needing less work can come online before December 1st. Um, that said, uh, I'm not going to commit and say yes, they are because I don't know. I mean, I, there's still work to be done. Um, but we do need to prioritize some of the populations that we know really are struggling to access remotely. And so it's not going to be one of those things, you know, do you have bubble gum for the whole class? Oh, no, then no one goes. I mean, we're going to be flexible and being in terms of as the buildings become available and to get kids back in. And we may, uh, you know, it may look very different, right? If a, if we're able to open, you know, say they're Gen Ziano and, and bring some programming in there, that even though your homeschool might be I don't know, the Winter Hill or the Brown, you might wind, be going to a new school. I mean, I think what COVID has taught us for better or for worse is uh, being flexible and being, trying to be patient and, and these are kids, right? So it's hard to be patient, especially when it's your own child or when you're a teacher and you're desperate to see your kids because every day, every week that goes by in a student's life is a significant, uh, amount of time. So the, the push is to get kids back in, but in safely. And that has to do with ventilation. It also has to do with making sure that the testing, um, the COVID testing is up and ready. So let me, let me bounce it back over to Karen. And that raises another question for me, because that's part of my job in talking to you. The other question, Karen, is have you noticed that there is a difference in the needs of those instructors and educators who are dedicated towards special needs or IEP kids or, or um, uh, ability, ability, mobile ability kids? I mean, is there a different need for the educators than there are for the standard fourth grade teacher? Absolutely. I mean, there, there's a lot. Um there's a lot <laughs> that, that, that educators need to consider, uh, you know, and, and kind of need to be skilled at. Uh, I, I do know that um, in, in these times, special educators, so educators of students with, with special needs, uh, needed to create remote learning plans for each student who has an IEP. Um, and that, that was a lot of work because that involved, uh, you know, contacting each family, reviewing the plan, signing, and th so that all had to happen prior to the start of school. Um, and so, you know, even during the, our opening days, special educators needed more time to work on the development of those plans as opposed to other educators who ne weren't necessarily in the same situation. Yeah, so if I understand that, if you have a you know, a classroom of 20 students, you may have one uh, teaching plan. If you have a classroom of seven special needs, you have seven different learning plans. That could be the case, yes, depending on, uh, on the makeup of each class. Right. Well, if, that, if nothing else, that should be a lesson that we should revere our educators because uh, that would be like having a highly specialized um, work schedule for seven different employees rather than here's the mission this mm -hmm. is what we do and this is how we operate on one plan so hats off to all of those special needs educators who were able to do that carrie you're you're um advocating on the school committee side that's my my interest is how does it fit with what karen does and what the unions do how do all three of you play nice and get the same result? Um, uh, well, I, I will say first and foremost, uh, what the teachers have done, what Karen has also done, and I think she's being humble, uh, long before COVID, and there are so many things about the groundwork that we do already established in Somerville that I'm so grateful for. We had gone from a model of teacher professional development where you contract someone, and they, they come in and they have the fancy slideshow and then they leave and they're not part of the district. Long before COVID, we, 
migrated to a, a model of professional development where our teachers were teaching each other, right? How, who knows our students better than our teachers? N no one. And so if there was someone who had more of an expertise in one area, we could develop a professional development uh, unit lesson i'm not sure what the lingo is karen so that we already had that in place and so then to then when we when COVID happened to be able to then say um what are your technical skills what are your other skills that we can now develop professional training units on if we had to rely on expertise coming from outside of the district uh, i don't we would not be where we are um, and I would also argue that it would not have been as high quality professional development than what our teachers are able to uh, and uh, staff teach each other. I can tell you as a parent, uh, the, before the first day of school, the high school had an orientation. You go through and you meet each, each um, teacher. And I, I was blown away at, by how competent and calm and engaging all of the teachers were and i've known many of them in person but to be able to convey that warmth and welcoming back uh remotely was huge and and it continues i mean i my son would hate it but i do sometimes listen in you know for if his, he's upstairs if i in the hallway and to hear students talking with each other you hear the educators it's not easy right especially teenagers are never easy at but for them to be able to engage students at this level remotely, it, it, it speaks volumes about the amount of work that was done last spring over the summer. And then our teachers came back August 28th or 9th, that first Monday before Labor Day. I mean, it is, um, it is, uh, it takes my breath away and I am deeply grateful for that. So that kind of partnership, I mean, yes, that we had to negotiate uh, memorandums of agreement and we have spent a, a large amount of time negotiating not just with the, the Somerville Teachers Association but with all of our unions and people I will say have been very flexible with the the cafeteria workers right we're not opening cafeterias and and we need them and and they need we don't want to put any we didn't want to furlough anyone we wanted to keep people employed and so through that negotiations we now have our the people who are normally staffing the cafeterias they are out at the schools doing the grab and go meals and so when students come there is another familiar face another human contact another connection to their school and no, so Carrie, i'm i'm sorry i'm so glad you said that because I'm facing the windows of the street here, and when I was on an earlier call, I saw the joy in the little one's face from across the street. She was getting out of the car and she had her grab and go lunch. Mm -hmm. and of course, I can hear, you know, and she said, and guess who I saw today? And it was the cafeteria worker that she was expecting to see. I don't know how their schedules linked synced up but she was so happy to see miss whatever her name was in, in the cafeteria so i want to go back carrie i'm sorry i interrupted you you good i want to go back i'm all set yeah thank I, you I, I want to go back to karen for one second so karen you're kind of the you know hey karen i need this person <laughs> where do you go when you need something <laughs> that's a what a great question um lots of different places back to the teachers back to the uh, administrators uh you know uh, being in the district for a while now i i kind of have a sense of who's who and who might know what um i also have a um a really great support network that's a a job alike group if you will so uh, administrators in other districts that are in a role similar to mine and so we email each other all the time too and say hey we're looking for something on this or you know what are you doing around orientation or you know like what does that look like this year and so i i, I do feel really uh really supported both in the district and and, and beyond so so the professional developer has professional developers that you hang out with <laughs> absolutely. absolutely hey that's the way most of us do it <laughs> you know we have our contemporaries in the fields in the chosen fields and once in a while, it's good to get outside of that circle that you spend eight, 10 hours a day in and just say, do you have the same type of complainers in your system that we have in ours? Or, 
Oh, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. Type of absolutely brilliant educators. There, right. there you go. There we go. Right. We we also have really really great partners uh, partnerships that the the district has with local universities with uh, with Leslie with Tufts with Boston University with Harvard um, and so you know just those connections that we uh, have developed over the years those are also great resources uh, when we're looking for something really specific. Gary Norman, don't mute yourself so quickly. You're not off the hook yet. <laughs> Carrie, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn over like the next minute uh, over between you and Karen. Anything you want to wrap up on on what what has transpired and where we're going in well into the late fall months? Uh, you know, I, I'm I, I, the focus to get back into the buildings is oh is primary, and also focusing on the remote learning. That's where we, that is what. The phase that we're in now and so it's both looking at the immediate needs what are the the unexpected glitches how do you navigate those but also look long term uh i it's balancing both of those things and um being appreciative i i i don't mean to sound goody two shoes of, about it but i do think it's important to recognize uh and i realize that when i i've gotten some you know, Parents have shared their frustrations with me in, in a variety of ways. And, and at the end of the day, I get it. This is not the, the education model that any of us want. Uh, there is no great pathway for it, but what is the best way that we can move forward given the set of circumstances? And that is um, something I have to keep reminding my, myself to do. Always assume the best. Great. Karen. Very quickly, just, uh, you know, I've heard it been described that recently uh, that every every teacher is a first year teacher again, because everyone's learning how to do this for the first time, right? And so usually we have a support network for our first year teachers. Uh, and and now we're all in the same boat. Um, but everyone is just willing to, to keep learning and keep supporting each other. We opened our year long district PD catalog yesterday. Uh, and we already today have over 800 uh, registrants. For, for the different PDs. And so I'm just grateful to the teachers for their continued dedication. Um, and and I, I look forward to our continued work together. Thank you so much. Well, there you have it, a master class from Karen Woods and Carrie Norman about how well two organizations can work together for the benefit of educators and children. So I wanna thank you both for attending today, but this educator has to cut off this call because I'm on to the next class. So <laughs> on behalf of the Somerville Media Center, thank you so much. Somerville School Committee Chair, Carrie Norman, and Karen Woods, the Director of Educator Development, Somerville Public School Systems. As always, please stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you the next time.